Uh, great to see everybody. The last few weeks, there's been about 10 of us here together. And uh, this week, uh, there's just so much sickness going through for everybody. Uh, it's just uh, really good to see you. And we're working on this, this idea of bold. What, does bold. what does bold look like as you go out into the world, as you interact with the world? And uh, you remember Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks uh, got on the bus and the bus driver stops, says, okay, you need to get out of that seat and move to the back. Black people sit in the back, white people sit in the front. And she said, I'm not going to do it. I'm not doing it. Now, it was against the law for her to do it. But she said, I'm not going to do it because it's wrong. And I'm going to do what's right. Boldness, godly biblical boldness, rarely has to, anything to do with what you're going to, how you're going to impact somebody else and how you're going to get somebody else to do what you want them to do. It has everything to do with are you going to do what's right? Even though others want to move you, others want to say, no, no, listen, listen, we can have peace if you'll just change. We, we can, we'll get along just great. We'll be really great together as long as you, you, you change. You've got to give up that position. You've got to say this. You've got to do that. And all throughout, all throughout that period of time, many, many Americans said, no, we're not going to do that. That's wrong. I'm not going to do the wrong thing. I'm going to do the right thing. And so as we begin to work our way through boldness today, I want you to understand that's, that's what it looks like to be bold. And for a believer, somebody who is following Christ, almost always, I, I'm going to say always, <coughs> boldness comes down to, am I going to do what I know is right? Or am I going to bend? Am I going to compromise? To kind of get along. And so uh, I want to take a look at where boldness, again, we, uh, where, does it, where does it play out, right? So I need boldness in my heart. Boldness in my heart is where you, bef- between you and God, you go, okay, I know what is right and I know what is wrong. It's called conviction. Conviction is when I know something is right and I know the right path to be able to take that. I'm convicted and I, I find out what, what is moral, what is right, who I am, my identity. All of that is personal. It's in your heart. Secondly, you need boldness in relationships. Uh, if you're in any relationship whatsoever, you need boldness. But if you're married, you got to have boldness. Why? Because you're called upon to sacrifice, to love, to do what's best for the other person, no matter what it costs. To be able to do the right thing consistently takes enormous boldness. It is your own flesh. It's your own uh, bad habits that constantly tempt you to move and compromise and go in the other direction. Relationships take enormous amount of boldness. And also I want to talk about your roles. You've been given roles. And in those roles is really where boldness comes to play. It's where, where you live those, those things out. And so oftentimes when you've get given a role, sometimes you choose the role. Sometimes you're like, yes, I accept that role. Sometimes you make a decision that puts you into the role, and God says, yeah, in this role, this is the responsibility you have. This is where you need to be able to be bold. And so there's the leader of my home. If you are a husband, God says you are the leader of in your home. And you might go, I, I don't really want to be the leader. My wife's a better leader. I think I'll just... This is what happens when someone's been given a role and they, they compromise. They've been given a role and they don't have the boldness to do it. It destroys that relationship. It hurts people. You've watched this over and over again, especially in the parent role. In the parent role, when a parent accepts that role, my role, my purpose in life is to prepare this person to be an adult. That's my role. It's not to make them happy. It's not to be their best friend. My role is to prepare this person to be an adult, to survive and thrive in whatever the world looks like when that person gets there. That is my role. But you've watched it. You've watched what happens when a man says, that's my role, 
but I'm going to focus on something else. When a man says, that's my role, but I, I don't have the boldness to do it, I can't do it. It's too hard. You've watched what happens. It destroys families. It destroys their lives. Now, the parenting role, right? There's two ways to get in the parenting role. There's a few of you out there that chose to have children. You're like, we want to have children. And you got out your encyclopedia and you looked it up. And you're like, oh, that's how you do it. Others of us, <laughs> others of us, we didn't do it because we wanted to have children. We love the process that leads to having children. And so we have children. It doesn't matter how you became a parent. The role responsibility is exactly the same. Well, I didn't choose this. It has nothing to do with it. That is the role. That's the responsibility that you have been given. That's true for a member of a church. And the member of a church... Any healthy church has a good amount of conflict in it. Any healthy church has this person who says, listen, I think we should, we should apply God's truth this way. And I have this going on in my life. And this person is like, no, no, no. I think we should do it this way. And then we have temptation and sin and failure. It takes a lot of boldness to love each other and go, no, 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 no. I know this is ugly and this hurts. But you belong to me and I belong to you. We're in this together. It takes boldness to be able to do that. And then as a citizen as well. So I, I'm going to be really clear about an issue I'm going to talk about today because um, it's not because this issue is the biggest issue in the world, but I think it helps us with how you make these decisions. How do you be bold in the world that we live in? How do, how do we do this? And a couple families in our church have come and talked to me about, listen, my child is uh, I'm a teenager, uh, you get, it's younger as well now, uh, they're going to school and they're telling them that if they don't tell, uh, call a boy a girl who wants, who's a boy but wants to be called a girl, then they get in trouble. What do we do? This is a bold issue. This is an issue of, am I going to say what I know is true or am I going to go, well, I know that's not true, but I'll go along with the lie to get along. That's what I'll do. How do you do that? How do, you, how do we interact with that? So I want to give you a little illustration here in terms of how you make wise decisions. This is the foundation or how you build boldness. What is at the root of your boldness? What is the root of your boldness? Where do you stand on? How do you make these kind of decisions? Where do you begin to make these kinds of decisions? And so uh, we have a slide up there. they got the tree. The tree's got the root. At the root is absolute truth. Absolute truth. Absolute truth in, in terms of what the Bible says is you, you get truth from the Bible. God has told us what is true. And throughout the Bible, he gives us a lot of statements, a lot of truth. And he says, listen, this is absolutely true. You live by this, it leads to life. You, you live by the lie, and it leads to destruction. Absolute truth is then turns into principles or practices. Oh, because this is true, then this is the way I'm going to practice that. Or because these two things are true, that means this principle is true, and this is the way I'm going to practice that. And then, and then out of that practice, over time, comes fruit, what we see happening in everyday life. So what's an absolute truth? Gravity is an absolute truth. Every time I do that, I come back down. Every time. <clears throat> It doesn't matter how hard I jump. It doesn't matter how hard I try. It doesn't matter how many times I do it. I come back down every time. How come? Gravity in our universe is an absolute truth. You take a sphere, a, a, some matter, and it has gravitational pull. The bigger it gets, the more gravitational pull that it has. It ha so happens that the earth has the perfect amount of gravi gravitational pull for us to be able to live. Now, you can make decisions and... And you, it's wise to go, okay, that's absolutely true. Therefore, my principles and practices need to be in line with that. And many people have gone, I think we can beat it. I think we can beat it. I'm going to make a decision off of something else. And so they went and they put feathers together and they made wings and they jumped off cliffs. And they met gravity. <laughs> right? It's an absolute truth. So that was the fruit. Right? The principle and the practice is jumping off the cliff. 
The fruit is if the cliff's high enough, you die. That's absolute truth. How do you make these decisions? Parenting. So in parenting, one of the principles of the absolute truth is parents are responsible to protect their children. They're responsible to protect their children. Another principle along the way is, yeah, but I love my child and I want to I, I want to encourage my child and I want to be really, really, I, I want to be close to my child, right? And so here's another absolute truth. A speeding car going 55 miles an hour, meeting a body, kills the body. It's an absolute truth. So therefore, what do you do? How do you interact with your kids? Well, some people go, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I am gonna, I'm going to try to figure out how to protect my child for the rest of his life um, without ever, I'm not going to spank him, I'm never going to spank him, that's all bad. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to discipline him. I'm never going to, I'm not going to, I'm just going to be close to him, right? And so you do, that's what you do. And he, he keeps running out on the street. He keeps running out on the street. But you've got a plan. He runs out on the street. The car's coming. You run and you save him. You run in front of him. The car hits you, not the child. You get to do that once. One time. And the fruit is bad. Why is the fruit bad? Because you built it off. You denied an absolute truth. You, try, you came up with principles and practices that were not in line with what was true. Now, many times the fruit can look really good. And we're very, very tempted to make our decisions based on the fruit. We're very, very tempted. This is another parenting thing. We're very, very tempted to discipline our kids based on them changing their behavior so they do what we want them to do. I got the fruit I wanted. And when you do that, you're always going to do one of two things. One, you're going to be way too harsh. Yes, your kid does obey, but he knows you don't do what's best for him because you put tacks in his shoes to make sure he does what you want him to do. You're going to be too harsh. Or number two, you're going to be way too lenient because you just keep giving in so that you have a loving, happy home. And that really works. And you think you have the greatest kid in the world until he hits junior high. And then he hits junior high, and you go, oh, he was a great kid, but he hung with the wrong crowd. No, you never built any character into his life. Because you, you, you based it on the fruit. I'm getting the fruit I want, so it must be it's working. You're ignoring the absolute truth that's underneath it. That prepares us for Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, uh, a couple of you have interacted with me today and or this week. And you're like, hey, I got out into Hebrews. I started reading it because you're stu- you're, we're working through it here in churches. It's hard. They're like, this is really, really hard. Well, I want to encourage you. It is really hard. Like, it's really hard to di- directly read and go like, what is he talking about? At least it was hard. It's hard for me. And so I'm guessing it's hard for you, along with the people that said that. A big part of that is because Hebrews is written to a Jewish audience that knows the Old Testament. And so a lot of Hebrews is him just quoting these passages from the Old Testament. And when he quotes them, he doesn't give context or anything. He just pulls his piece out of it and says, like it says this, and like it says this, and you walk you down through it. So it's hard to follow that. And the other piece is um, he doesn't say, this is what I'm trying to teach you, and therefore A, B, C, and D once I wrestled with it for a while, I go, oh yeah, he actually is doing that. But when I first read it, I didn't see it that way. We don't have time today to take Hebrews chapter 2 and for me to walk you all through all of those pieces of it. Um, I'm asking you to trust me that it, it actually is a logical sequence. And I'm going to ask you to trust me that the principles that I bring out of it are biblical. I would ask you to, if you, if you are at home, grab your Bibles, open it to Hebrews, so you can go, okay, I see where he is in the chapter, I see where he is in the chapter. Here, just pull out your phones and kind of follow along in Hebrews as well. Um, and so what I want to do is work through, do you live from the root or the fruit? And I'm going to give you absolute truths that come out of this chapter. There's five absolute truths that come out of this chapter. So here we go. Uh, everyone is disobedient and will pay for their re- rebellion. How does the world work? The world works this way. There are lies and there's truth. If you build your life on the lie, it leads to destruction. One of the great lies 
is he's really good at heart. I know, I know, I know he killed that guy, but he's really good at heart. And you hear that from all different forms, right? You hear parents, the kid's throwing them fit. Ah, I know he's, gonna, he's not really being good today, but he's really good at heart. The Bible says, no, you're not. You're not. You're disobedient and you're rebellious. And you're going to pay for it. The Bible says in the Old Testament, there's no sin that goes unpunished. It's the framework for absolute truth. It's the framework for understanding humanity and eternity. In Hebrews 2.1, he says this. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. So this chapter fits exactly what we're, we're talking about. The reason for that is because the chapter wasn't written for this message. This message came from the chapter. Right? So we must pay most careful attention to what we've heard so we don't drift away. Drift away and boldness are opposites. Boldness is, no, I stayed true. Drifting away is the opposite of boldness. For since the message spoken through angels was binding, he's talking about the message of angels to Moses, and that's the first five books of the Old Testament, were, was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment. We know what the problem is. The problem is that we sin, and God is holy and righteous and good, and therefore we are under his wrath you will pay for that punishment. That's the foundation. That's the first foundational truth. Second, if you ignore this, this salvation, you will fade away. What's boldness built on? Boldness is built on salvation. It's built on Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ's salvation. His work throughout Hebrews chapter 2, he's actually making the point, the first Hebrews chapter 1, he made the point that Jesus is higher than the angels. He is, he is uh, to be worshipped and praised, and he is truly God. Chapter 2 is Jesus is truly man. There was a belief that had begun to rise up that, yes, Jesus was God, Jesus was God, but he wasn't truly man. And in chapter 2, he's like, no, he was truly, fully man. And he says, if you ignore this salvation, you, I, <clears throat> if you ignore this salvation, this is what he says, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? What, ch what chance do you have if you know salvation and you turn away from it? Where are you going to go? That's the world you live in. The world you live in is this person says, this is going to save us, and this is going to save us, and this is going to save us. Follow this. That's terrible. This is great. He says, okay, so if you know salvation, if you're here today and you don't know salvation, you, you've never met Christ, you don't know what it's like to have Christ forgive you of your sins and set you free and invite you into his family, I, just, I beg you to hang around Skyline long enough to at least find out what it is. It's, just, it's too good to be true. Just hang out long enough to find out what it is. But for those of you who've tasted it, if you turn away from it, where are you going to go? Who are you going to go to? And understand, when you're bold, godly bold, you're focusing on that salvation. When you drift, when you compromise, you're turning away from it to something else. The word ignore is that I know it, but I ignore it. I heard you, but you ignore it. The Bible presents the picture that mo for the most part, no, I, for the most part, totally, we actually know the truth. We just ignore it. We know what is best. We just ignore it. Human beings don't make their decisions from logical brain thinking. We talk like we do, we, we write books like we do, we don't. We make decisions from our souls. That's why a guy can know if I take the next drink, I'm going to lose my family and everything that matters to me. And they do it anyway. That's why when you were five years old, you knew you were going to get in real trouble if you stole that cookie. 
but you did it anyway. You believed that you could do good outside of God. How should we escape if I ignore so great a salvation? Number third, third principle. Grace, forgiveness, and transformation by the cross is the answer to our problem. Grace, forgiveness, and transformation by the cross is the answer to our problem. This is a big deal. It's a really big deal. So am I saying that's the answer to like church and your spiritual life? No, not just church and your spiritual life. Am I saying that's the answer to your financial life? Absolutely I am. Am I saying that's the answer to your marriage? Absolutely I am. Am I saying that's the answer to the problem I have with my teenager and my children? Absolutely I am. Wait, wait. Did I go all churchy on you? I'm usually pretty good not going all churchy. Did I go all churchy on you and like make this church the center of everything that's happening? Am I truly, truly saying that grace, forgiveness, and transformation is the answer to life's problems? Absolutely, I am. Hebrews 2.9 says, and before this passage, he says, it, it, was, it's, it was good that Jesus is the captain of your salvation. He's the one who's leading your salvation. And, and, he, and he talks about how it was supposed to be that men uh, were given, men and women are given to, they were supposed to submit the earth. They were supposed to rule over the earth in a really healthy way, in a godly way. And they're like, but you don't see that. You don't see that. It looks like, actually, sometimes it looks like the earth overrules us, or, the, or we do it really poorly, right? He said, but what you do see is Jesus. You see, he says the world was broken. It's broken. But what you do see is Jesus, who was made a little lower than angels for a little while. He looked like he was a little lower than angels. Why? Because he, came, he became human. Now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. So that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Jesus has come before you, and he died for you so that you could have grace, which means you can't change yourself. Everyone needs grace. Mankind is declaring boldly over and over again, we can save ourselves. Do this. This is the way to do it. We are great. This is amazing. It's going to be incredible. Even now, we're going to make people live forever. And they can't save themselves. They need somebody else to save them. That's what grace is. The grace of God that he might taste death for everyone that you might have forgiveness. Jesus died in your place and offers you forgiveness and transformation to change you. You know what's great about heaven? Heaven is not great because I'm going to have what I want. Heaven is great because I'll actually be who I want to be. I'll never lie to you again. My hair will never stick up funny again. Right? I'll never, I'll never ever talk crossly or in a way that puts my wife down ever again. I will be so full of joy and I will spread joy to you. in such amazing, and that's going to be true for you too. Transformation. That is the answer. Fourth, Jesus is not ashamed to call you brother and sister. This one, I want you to sit on this one. I want it to soak into your heart. Jesus is not ashamed to call you brother and sister. Now, we often think of boldness. I do. I often think of boldness when it first happens or somewhere along the way. I'm like, okay, this is about me. Can I be bold? Can I be strong? Can I do the right thing? It's not about me at all. It's about Jesus. Jesus. Can I trust him? Is he really the absolute truth? Will he really produce the fruit he promised to produce if I trust him? It's about whether or not 
I'm proud of Jesus or I'm ashamed of him. Compromise is about whether or not, yeah, this is who I'm with. He's my brother. That's who I trust. Or do I need to leave him at the door so I can get along with you or the world? Hebrews 2.11 says this. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He's the one who makes you holy. And the one he makes holy become the same family. Now, the background of this verse is about Jesus being fully human. And that he's really, literally becomes our brother. He invites us into his family. And he says, I am not ashamed to call you my brother. I'm not ashamed to call you my sister. I'm not ashamed. You belong with me. Are you ashamed of you? Of course you are. You know you. None of us know you. I've I've said this a million times. I am so glad you cannot read my thoughts. I would be so embarrassed if you ever knew the crazy things I think. (laughs) And you would be too. You'd be embarrassed by the things. If we knew what you think, well, you'd be so embarrassed. Jesus knows all that. And he goes, I'm not ashamed of you. Why? Because I gave you my righteousness. I've made you holy and pure and valuable. You may not believe it yet, but that's what I've done for you. You're my brother. You're my sister. I'm not ashamed of you. Number five. Jesus has overcome what you're facing. Jesus has overcome. This is an absolute truth. Jesus has overcome what you're facing. And is offering to share himself as the solution. So many times in life, we really feel like Jesus is far, far away. And when we feel like he's the most far away is when we failed at a temptation. Or how many times have you been in, in the middle of a temptation? You're like, I want to do that. I wanna, it's wrong. I want to do that. I want to do that. It's wrong. I, I need to change. I need to move. I need to give in. I... I And you think, okay, Jesus, go sit over there. I need to make the decision if I'm going to do the right thing or not. And you know what he says? No, 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 no. I know exactly what you're going through. I want to come help you in the temptation. What? He wants to come be with you in the temptation. When you're struggling to do the right thing, when you're struggling to be bold, and you're, you're, you're so tempted... To give in. No, I want to be there with you. He says this. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human. In every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service of God. A high priest is someone who takes you and takes you to the power of God. Now, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are actually one God. They're one God. I don't know how this works. I don't know how they're one, Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, how they interact. I don't know exactly how all that works. I just want to make it clear again. It's it's one God. But in this one God, they, they present themselves, or they are, three persons. A high priest is someone who goes, all right, you're not able to access the power of God right now, but I am going to connect you to God. I'm going I'm to bring you into his presence. I'm going to be the bridge that gets you there. The reason why Jesus can be this person is because he is fully human. He's not foreign to you. He doesn't not understand you. He's fully human. So he can, he, he can say, yeah, I'm here with you, and he's fully God. So he has every right to go into God's presence anytime, all the way, and put you together. 
service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. That he is, the reason he can be this is because he's paid for all of your sin. That's not between you and God anymore if you've come to know him. Then he goes on to say this, because he himself suffered when he was tempted. Time out. You ever, you ever do this, okay, Jesus was tempted thing, and you hear the story of 40 days in the wilderness, and he's hungry, and he, he's tempted at all these things, and go, well, yeah, but he's Jesus. Like, he's God. He can't sin. How's that a temptation? I mean, it's academic. He was just sitting there going, man, I can't wait till these 40 days get done. Got to go through this. Not true. He suffered as a human. He suffered just like you did. You do. Can you imagine what it was like for him to be on the cross? He is. He's being spit on. He's got that crown, crown of crown of thorns. He is being whipped. He's hanging from a cross. He has the power to get off at any moment. At any moment, he can go, I've had enough. But he suffered. He didn't compromise. He suffered for us. He says, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he's able to help those who are being tempted. He's not distant. He's not far away. He is right there with you. He wants to walk through that temptation with you. He wants to give you the boldness you need in the moment. It's amazing. Those are the five principles or five absolute truths from Hebrews. Now, how can a parent be boldly full of grace and truth? So specifically, we're, for this message, I'm applying it to Okay, how do you teach your child to go to school and interact with a situation where all the authorities and peer pressure tells you that you should tell somebody else at school, yep, you, you're a boy, but you feel like a girl, so therefore you are a girl. Which, if you've taught your child from the Bible at all, the Bible's crystal clear. God created them, male and female. In his image, he created them. It's crystal clear. When I was a kid, uh, evolution had really become, started to become big. A lot of academics, it was big to them, but the average kid you went to school with, they knew better. Like, I've seen creation, man. Somebody had to create this thing. But... Over the course of my lifetime, only fools believe in creation now. But the absolute truth that you were created by God in his image gives you value and meaning and purpose. Evolution, you're worth less. You, your life doesn't matter. You don't matter. Oh, no, I think it really does because, no, you made all that up, man. No, that's a fairy tale you made up. The fact that you get your identity from being created by God is huge. It, imp it, it causes so much fruit in your life. You, you can't know how much great fruit that causes in your life. You as a parent are in a role where you are responsible to teach your child, help him understand that it's absolutely true that he was created by God. And God gives him his identity. And whatever God has given him, it's an incredible identity. So what do you do? I think you ask these questions. I, I want to ask these questions of you as you interact with your kids. Now, if you're not a parent, you can apply this to lots of other situations in your life. But this is a real-life thing that our parents are going through. Um, number one, is God your source of truth? 
Do you even understand that? Do you understand that God is your source of truth? That Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't just mean spiritually. He means he's the truth. By the way, science and truth are not in conflict in any way, shape, or form. God and true science are not in conflict in any way, shape, or form. Science is the pursuit of truth. You do science long enough, you always are going to end up with God. They're not in conflict. What's your source of truth? Do you have the Bible as maybe part of your life? Then it's going to be really hard to be bold when it counts. Second question, is the gospel your focus or just one of the options? Now, it, the, the, the passage we walked through was said this. If you ignore salvation, if you pr- approach life and go, okay, I, I know about salvation. I know about that. That's great. It's great for my church life, and I like it. It makes me feel good. It's great. But, man, what about all these other issues? You're ignoring salvation. You, you, you don't under, you're not approaching life that, listen, in life, it's very, very clear. Men are broken and hurting, and that's why we have all this devastation in the world. And Jesus has come, and he's the answer. Is that the core? Do you understand that what kind of comes into number two, or number three? Do people need to be accepted, made to feel valuable, that's huge in our world. If, you, if you're my age or younger, which I think is all of us, you have been taught that the only problem with people is they weren't told how great they are. That when they were young, they were stifled, and, and you need to build their self-image. People need to think that they are beautiful and amazing and wonderful. And if you make them think that way, they'll act that way. Have you bought into that? Or is it true that what people really need is grace and forgiveness and transformation? Mom and dad and teenagers, what you're being told is you need to agree with the lie that people believe because if you won't agree with that lie then you're hurting them and they will hurt themselves is that true or is it true that what they need to hear is listen I know you're hurting but what Jesus has offered is this number one you're not you're not just an amoeba turned into a human. You've been created by God. And God loves you so much that even though you've lived in rebellion to him and even though you've gone your own way, he paid for all that and he is inviting you to eternal life and eternal meaning and eternal purpose. He he wants to grab you and bring you into his arms. Mom and dad, which one are you using? Absolute truth or fruit to make the decision? Fruit says, based on the fruit, I need to treat them nice so they'll be nice. Now, anybody who's lived longer than five years knows that fruit goes, it always spoils. Give a child everything he wants. He's a miserable person. Give a child the truth. Give him the truth. And he has a chance for joy. Next question. Are you ashamed to call Jesus your brother? This one hit me, man. This one really hit me. If I've ever done this, I I take it back, I take it back, I take it back. But it's become popular for pastors to go, well, I know that's what the Bible says, and I'm sorry the Bible says that, and I wish I wouldn't have said it that way, and I wish it didn't say that. That's terrible. 
You know who wrote the Bible? Jesus. It is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Every word in there. The original manuscripts, every word in there came from God. And when we do that, you know what we're doing? We're going, that's my brother, but I'm ashamed of him. No. No, you want to be bold? You want to teach your kids to be bold? There, God himself loves you and has done an amazing, a miraculous thing to become your brother. And he has put himself in the position where he says, I am not ashamed of you. When it comes time to be bold, when it comes to mind for me to be bold, for me, th- this one question, right? Am I ashamed of my brother? I am not ashamed of my brother. I have no right to ever be in his presence. How can I be ashamed of my brother? And lastly, are you trying to solve problems outside of Jesus? Are you having conversations with people and trying to figure things out and trying to solve problems outside of Jesus? Because if you are, you will always, always come up with a solution that hurts people. Pretty amazing stuff, huh? Pretty amazing. Did you know there was somebody before? Now I have a mental block. Who did I start the message with? Rosa Parks. One person was listening. (laughs) Did you know that there were many people before Rosa Parks? One of them was Claudette Coven. Claudette Coven was 15 years old. She was the high schooler that we're talking about today going to school. Her name was Claudette Coven. And in school, she'd been learning about Harriet Tubman. Harriet Tubman was an incredibly bold woman who knew Christ well. All these things we said is truth. That's what Harriet, that's what Harriet Tubman built her life on and was willing to give her life to free slaves, to get them out of slavery. And, and, and Miss Coven, had, she's 15 years old. She learned about it. She learned about it. She got on the bus. She says, I sat down. The bus driver came back and said, you got to move out here. And she said, I could just hear Harriet Tubman going, stay there. Don't bend. Be bold. Stay there. I put in the bold part. She didn't actually say that. Right. <laughs> stay there. She got arrested. She got falsely accused of fighting with the police. She was part of the spark that changed so many people's lives. You can be too. If you'll build your life on Jesus, don't ignore such a great salvation. Lord Jesus, thank you. You've already told us the truth. Lord, give us the courage, the the courage to be bold, to do what is right, regardless of what it's going to cost us. In your name we pray. Amen.